Hello students, we will continue our study of critical regionalism and today we will go beyond the introduction to look at critical regionalism in Indian architecture and there will be a series of at least four presentations where we will talk of buildings that were under the uh, classification of critical regionalism. Now, you might be wondering that now we have reached to, uh, we have done a very large chunk of this course and much of our course has been concentrated on concepts and evolution ideas of modern Indian architecture. The range of various ideas and concepts that have shaped the creation of a modern Indian architecture and that is very true that our focus till now we have looked at very few buildings in the 21st century. We have touched upon building all the way up to the 1990s. We have looked at a couple of buildings, a few buildings beyond that also. The reason why that is happening is one is that whenever we look back for the, to the study of architecture, we get that window of let us say about 15 to 20 years in which the building has already been used it has already been uh, in existence and people have been able to study the building, observe the building and its behavior and the response of the people in general and much has also been written about that building. So, that gap is also important when we are doing a study like this. So, so for example, some building is just come up in the last maybe 5 or 10 years there will be very little information available to talk in detail about that. But we will touch upon several examples like that in passing so that you understand how the current architecture is evolving. The other thing is that these ideas that I am talking to you about form the basis of much of what modern architecture or modern buildings are. Now, that is not just true for India, it is true for, 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 for buildings across the world. If you look at the works which are extremely uh, curvilinear or fantastic forms that you see today uh, being produced by a, a range of architects, you look at the core concept behind it and you will be taken back to the very foundation of modernism. Free flowing spaces for example, is a concept that came in modernism. Of course, that space is being expressed in many ways today, but the core idea remains the same. The reason why the buildings have become such, have such amazing forms today is primarily because of the kind of digital technology that we have or software tools that we have that are able to capture our imagination on paper or let us say on the computer screen. The other thing is of course, the advancement in building construction technology and structural technology that makes such buildings feasible today. Right from the time of the industrial period uh, somewhere around the middle of the 19th century when structural engineering became a separate branch from architecture in Europe and true structural calculations took the place of empirical hit and trial methods. Right from then onwards structures and the understanding of structural design analysis has evolved and now it has come to a very advanced stage. It is also being aided by immense amount of uh, software technology that makes mundane calculations much more easier and faster to perform. And that is why many more imaginative structural solutions are possible today because of that. So, the growth and the evolution of forms and the kind of uh, the buildings we are seeing today has a lot which is because of advancement in technology. So, is there a new concept coming up? that redefines when uh, modern houses, modern corporate buildings, very limited conceptual changes have happened. They have happened, there is no denying that and if we someday you get an opportunity to study modern world architecture, you will see some of these concepts being you know brought forth in those buildings in the 90s, 80s and the 1990s. In India, I believe that one of the dominant trends has been this combination of modern with regional architecture. 
most of the iconic works that we see around us or that we remember or that is being talked about in academic circles and that are there is a lot of raving reviews written about them are predominantly in the category of regional modernism or critical regionalism. So, let us go back again to this. When what has been the impact of globalization on architecture in India post 1991 transforming cities has led to a homogenizing built environment globally. There are similar built spaces and buildings that are not responsive to regional context. Look at this the, the picture that is on, on the side. If you consider the architecture then in the past, then Asia was different from Russia, from Europe and South America. Each one had its own regional identity. But then because of modernism, this is what happened. It became homogenized. The advantages of not modernism notwithstanding the fact that modernism brought in functional better buildings suited for an industrial society notwithstanding the fact it still remains that these buildings had a rootless placeless identity. And when you look at them you do not know whether the buildings are being made in Asia or South America or Europe. So, it disconnected people from their built environment. What then was the ideal solution? This is what I mean by placeless, rootless identity. Look at these glass and steel buildings, whether it is in Germany or Nigeria or the UK or Italy, all of them look the same. So much so that if I were to just to show you a photograph of a glass and steel building, it would be next to impossible for you to identify where that building comes from. But if I were to show you a picture of a regional building, with regional architecture in many cases you will be at least able to peg the picture to very close to where, to, to where it belongs. So, there has been a direct impact of masters in modernism in India and Louis Kahan has directly has directly been interpreted or taken forward by Anant Rajay. We see the direct impact of Kurbuzir on the work of Shivnath Prasad in the Akbar Hotel. We see the direct impact of Walter Gropius on the works, early works of A. P. Kanvinde in Atira uh, building. But there were many architects who worked with the masters and they decided that they needed to evolve. The, the very reason that led to the creation of an architecture, a modern Indian architecture with a regional identity that these people who had worked with the architects or uh, the master architects or studied under them, they wanted to move forward, but it took a long time for them to evolve their own architecture. By long time I mean period of a couple of decades to really uh, have a very strong footing in a style that was their own. The problem was of following the master and yet having to develop their own identities without doing it in an arbitrary manner just so that they would be they would appear to be different. And this very reason of some wanting to be different from what they had received from the modernists led to their failure. They could not they could not bring about a change that could be maintained consistently. But there were others who brought in change that could have that had a very solid foundation of concept and reason behind it. It did take some time for them to establish their own identity and some time to deal with the concerns of an, 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 a, a growing young India. But the ability to abstract the essence of ideas from others particularly from the West and the modernism of the West and to use them wisely brought them international recognition. Now, I not only mean abstraction from the essence of the western architecture or modernist, modernism from the west, but also drawing from drawing the essence of traditional vernacular architecture and interpreting it for a new period. That brought them international recognition. People like B. V. Doshi, Joseph Allen Stein, Charles Correa, uh, Raj Reval to name a few. 
Now, there has been a continuing impact of masters and modernism that is seen through the work of Indian architects. These are some of the buildings from the 1980s all the way into the 21st century and this reflects either a, a very refined form of brutalism like this work of Mataru Associates, this is the school of planning uh, uh, at, uh, and uh, architecture at uh, Hyderabad and this is the modern school that I have talked to you earlier. This is the Indian issue of forests management by Anant Rajay that clearly shows the imprint of uh, Louis Kahan. So, there is a complexity for a modern Indian architecture. What is that? Why is modern Indian architecture a very complex creature? Modernism on the other hand has a very neat and clean palette. The points are very logical and rational, clearly defined and globally used. But when we come to a regional approach, we are faced in India, which is India in, in if, you, if you talk about size and geographical reach of India, it is more or less as if you are talking about an entire continent like Europe. So, in India, there is enormous regional, climatic, geographical and cultural variations. There are fundamental differences in building materials and methods of construction and design approaches in different regions of India, right from traditional vernacular architecture. And many building types are needed today and that is the need of a modern India from economically weaker section housing to modern industrial plants and corporate buildings. Therefore, because of these vast variations in building typology, in regional variations, cultural variations, climatic variations, topographical variations, it is not feasible to have an architecture that is applicable to the whole of India. What are these variations? There is an enormous regional, climatic, geographical and cultural variations, enormous climatic variations. We are talking about a climate zone map where we have hot and dry, warm and humid, composite. This is the single largest belt that you see in India is of composite and then there are other pockets. Then there is temperate and cold. Composite within itself, this got five seasons in it. And not only that, composite within itself is not consistently the same from one part of the one region of composite climate under composite climate to another region. There also there are variations. Then there is enormous regional and geographical variations. Whether we are talking about the mountains, we are talking about the the, the, the backwaters of Kerala, we are talking of the desert of Rajasthan or the plains of North India. These are varying topographies from hills to the sea, from desert to green plains. We are talking of enormous cultural variations. The so called Thali, the basic uh, uh, full meal which is from different regions of India, the cuisine varies so tremendously and it is so unique and so interesting. And therefore, and, and over and above that, there is a fundamental difference in building materials, methods of construction and design approaches. So, if you are talking about a, a building in, 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 in the hilly areas of Himachal for example or Uttarakhand for example, or you are talking of Kerala, you are talking of Rajasthan, you are talking of Bengal, we are talking of different materials different ways of representing the material, different methods of construction and different approaches of design. You cannot have a courtyard planning in the hills, just as you cannot have a completely enclosed building in composite climate or even in Kerala. Now, in Kerala, you would require immense amount of toss ventilation because it is so hot and humid. So, we have to factor in these variations that was not really happening in modernism. Now, if you, if you reflect back on the lectures I have given you in the earlier days, remember what I told you, every one of those architects who came, who ventured into India in the modernist period, whether it was Kabuzir or Kahan or even earlier than that, uh, 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 Lutyens and Baker and others, all of them had to build their architecture around an Indian climatic response. Even Indian architects who brought in modernism as is in India. For example, A. P. Kanwinde, Habib Rahman and for example, Chitle in South India, they also had to modify their buildings to suit climatic conditions. 
the Atira building is a very direct correlation with the Bauhaus. I have talked about that earlier. The, the glass curtain walling of Bauhaus cannot be put in the Atira building. So that modification has to happen. And then there is a tremendous range in the types of buildings that we need. As I just mentioned to you earlier, in the pre-liberalization time also vast range was needed from projects as we have talked about the economically weaker section project of the Aranya low cost housing or the uh, so called or hospitals like the Ames or apartment buildings like the Kanchanchanga or modern 5 star hotels like the Meridian in Delhi, an industrial plant like the Dutsagar Dairy by AP Kanwinde and the NDDB building which is a corporate office of NDDB in Delhi again by Kanwinde. And the same tremendous range continues post liberalization whether it is a hotel or it is a hospital or it is a, a residential apartment block or a corporate building or EWS housing. So, so many variations have to be factored in. But modernism on the other hand brings about uniformity. In this picture is a series of pictures of cities in India and there is one picture of a city from Europe. But if you look at it, unless you have a very fine eye for a particular building that represents a city, you cannot identify which is which. For example, this is Mumbai, this is Kolkata, this is Bangalore, this is Gurugram, this is Frankfurt. If I were to switch the terminology, if I were to switch it and tell you that this is let us say Mumbai from a different angle if the picture was taken. It may not have been so easy for you to identify that. One of the ways for example, I would identify this picture is because I know this building, this is the Commerce Bank by Norman Foster and so I know I am I'm looking at a picture of Frankfurt. But in general, if I were not to even mention the names, you would be hard pressed to identify which city it is globally or even within India. That is modern uniformity for you. Even a simple thing or rather uh, that which is a cultural icon of today, the big M sign of McDonald's all over the world, so difficult for us to identify where these eateries are in which city of the world, all represented by the uniform architecture of McDonald's. So, Indian architects moved away from this direct influence of modernism or the masters and began to climate, began to work with climatically and culturally appropriate designs that were suited for Indian problems and Indian situations. The issue was also to do with climate, heat and dust, winter chills, social context, increasingly important issues with regard to designing buildings in India. This project that you see here is a prototype house called the tube house. This was designed by Charles Correa and uh, it has a fantastic stack effect of uh, taking uh, air in and bringing the hot air out from the top this vent that you see. So, the, the cool air moves in and creates a convection current inside and it brings, uh, it creates a, 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 a passive cooling and breeze within the house without the need of mechanical vent, uh, ventilation, mechanical cooling. So, it is also important to erect buildings within a tight budget that was also a very typical Indian constraint and particularly in the early years of the 70s and the 80s. Now, iconic works that were built by these architects of that generation which is a combination of modernism plus local and regional, local slash regional architecture, they were connected with either materials, climate and socio-cultural aspects in many, many cases all of them put together. So, some of the iconic works that came up which was a consequence of the use of materials and climate and socio-cultural context is this work in Kashmir by Joseph Allen Stein, this building by Laurie Baker in Trivan in Kerala, this is the Asian Games housing by Raj Rival, this is the Kovalam beach resort by Charles Correa and this is the Brissole of the I believe the Jodhpur University by UC Jain. Now, one house, one house 
made a vital impact on Indian architecture in more ways than one. Not only in Indian architecture, but globally. Now, of course, there are many such buildings. If you were to start studying them as case studies, you would find that they had a very definitive impact in the way modern architecture got shaped in the 20th and 21st century. But let us talk about one, the role of what is called as Maison Jaul, a set of two houses built by Le Corbusier in the 1950s in France. Maison in French means a house. So, this is the Jaul houses. The stylistic principles evolving in his monumental projects were again studied by him fundamentally in that one fundamental architectural test, the house. That is one thing I would like to add here is that most architects of repute have generally tested their initial concepts and principles via a small project, which generally always tends to be a house, whether it is F. L. Wright or Corbusier or many others. They, because a house is a very simple unit without much complexity of technology etcetera, where the architectural idea or the concept can be tried in its pure version. So, when we are talking of the work of Corbusier, over which his entire foundation of his early style was built or the international style was built, it lays, uh, it, 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 it lies in his idea of the domino system and the villas that he built ending with the summation which was Villa Savoy the five points leading to the nine points of a new architecture. So, coming back, the new ideas that he had tried post World War II were that of brutalism, were that of mass housing build projects like United Habitation, the use of more uh, sculptural forms, the use of more rugged and heavy mass in architecture, the impact that climate had on his buildings for example, in India. Now, all those ideas and principles that came in went back into the design of Maison Jaul. When load bearing, because remember when load bearing masonry was the norm in construction, it was at that time that he had talked about the five points of a new architecture and talked about prefabrication and standardization that have continued to be buzzwords in modern architecture from that time uh, and even from earlier onwards uh, going back all the way to the crystal palace. But he rejected his own ideas regarding the appropriate form in the machine age, which he said was a house for is a machine for living in and his concepts of modernism were retained. United Hematish Habitation for example, has a pilotus. We find the appearance of the pilotus even in the capital complex buildings of Chandigarh. We do find the, the, the fundamental ideas of five points of a new architecture in his later buildings, but now what he did was he combined the modern with the old. The white planar geometry for example, of Villa Savoy was now being replaced either by exposed concrete or exposed brick and concrete as in Maison Jaul. So, this is the movement from 1928 Villa Savoy to 1955 Maison Jaul. Now, in so again the comparison in the structural and construction system, this is a flat roof of Villa Savoy, but in Maison Jaul he goes in for a Catalan vault and instead of an open plan that was achievable through the domino system of an RCC frame, he goes in for load bearing brick walls which are supporting the Catalan vaults. Instead of the isolation of a project like the Villa Savoy, he goes in for proximity of these two units, two houses which form the Maison Jaul. Instead of the Pilotus, he goes in for a closed plinth, but both of them possess a roof garden. This being a more traditional version of a roof garden vis-a-vis -vis the Villa Savoy. Then again, we find exposed brick and concrete. Now, now let us compare Maison Jaul vis-a-vis -vis Villa Sarabai, because Villa Sarabai is a direct, so to speak, connect with Maison Jaul approximately the same time, 1955. Both have exposed brick and concrete, both have cattle and walls supported by load bearing walls, which form the structural system with base within Maison Jaul as well as the Sarabai house. Both possess dense greenery 
and and in this case of course there is water also in Villa Sarabai and both use primary colors in the interiors. Sarabai house is a step forward because it is it's a hybrid in that the hybrid structure of the Catalan vaults or the concrete vaults of Maison Jaul attached with or uh, uh, to that was added the bridge sole of Chandigarh and this bridge sole was not needed in Maison Jaul, it was not needed in the climate of France, it was needed in the hot climate of Ahmedabad and it was also suited for the hot climate and the construction in, uh, industry in India. So, we do find these deep verandas in a sense a bridge sole uh, being created in the Villa Sarabai. Then again the two units or wings uh, in, in the case of Villa Sarabai there are two wings which are perpendicular to each other, they are perpendicular to each other whereas in Maison Jaul there are two houses, two houses that are perpendicular to each other. The vaults in both cases once waterproofed are covered with earth and then the upper part of both becomes a wonderful roof garden. So, we find that in the Villa Sarabai, we find that in the Maison Jaul. Now, the Sarabai house specifically talks about a vaulted system that was there in the Maison Jaul which also helped in controlling the internal climate of the house. It has a rooftop garden that increases the thermal mass and reduces heat gain that you find here. It has these vaulted interiors also lead to easy flow of cool monsoon air through the interior because because of the vault you get these parallel bays. If you remember we have seen these parallel bays in another project. If your mind if you can pictureize it, it is a sept Ahmedabad which was also done which was done later than this, but they are also not having vault but flat roof, but Doshi employed the same idea to allow for breeze to flow through and through the modular base that is happening in the Sarabai house. And then there is the swimming pool in the back, the swimming pool here and the shaded verandas that you see which is through and through the house and these these for example, the, the, the picture that you see is taken from somewhere uh, this picture is somewhere here and then there is the pathway and this is the uh, the space through and through. So, these swimming pools and shaded verandas and there is this cool madras stone. In fact, one point that I would again uh, tell you later is about the use of the modular scale. So, all these lead to a passive cooling system. Now, there is a climatic and a cultural response in the Sarabai house. The bridge soleil on the south facade is the is a similar rhythm to the shaded arcade that you find in Fatehpur Sikri. This picture shows the connection. This is a build, uh, this is a, uh, this picture shows the the shaded arcade of Fatehpur Sikri vis-a-vis -vis the the uh, model the the bris solel uh, units uh, together in the Villa Sarabai as you see here in the picture. And this is a similarity drawn from the uh, cultural context. Then we have again the address to the cultural lifestyle. The important part is the entire Villa Sarabai is designed in such a manner that e, there is the particular indoor space is suited for a particular part of the day climatically. For example, there is this morning room that is provided here which is the dining room when the sun comes in and thus it becomes a very pleasant space to be in in the morning. Therefore there is a consonant response of interior spaces with respect to indoor thermal comfort and activity. That means, the indoor thermal comfort that is provided is connected with the connecting activity. So, if I move to a different part of the house in the afternoon based on my activity, that will be also the climatically best part or the ideal part of the house during that time of the day. That for example, I talked talk to you about the morning light penetrating into the dining room to help the start or to help start the day. Then there is this ability to redefine spaces throughout the day allowing for various activities to proceed because the climate automatically leads to such kind of utilization of spaces. Now, this is also an idea that we have seen in another project I talked about earlier and that is the a house that was done by Charles Correa 
in which there was a winter section and a summer section. I believe it was the, the Parikh house and in that particular house, certain section of the house was designed to be more suitable for the winters and certain section more suitable for the summers. You can also look up a similar kind of uh, concept in the tube house that I just showed you the prototype where actually there is a day section and a night section. So, the spaces there are, uh, that can be used in the day can then be adapted for use in the night. So, Charles Correa who gave us the dictum form follows climate was very, uh, he was uh, much concerned about this idea of the way spaces are used in relation to the uh, outdoor climatic conditions. We will uh, later on look at a project called the Kanchanjanga Apartments in Mumbai, where again we will look at this idea of how the climatic response and the indoor spaces are in correlation to each other. The house therefore, in the case of the Villa Sarabhai becomes an integral part of the daily routine of the, of the, of the occupants and pool is also there to give respite from the heat. Now, the scale itself, the amazing part of the scale that the Corbusier used in the overall proportions with regard to the height, with regard to the size of the base, with regard even to the grid that was formed of the marble, the black marble stone, madras uh, stone on the floor, all of it was based on the scale Lee modular that he, uh, that he had come up with. Now, you can read it up uh, uh, more deeply and you can understand more deeply about the Lee modular. So, all aspects of the house, the elements of the window, the distribution of the doors, the windows along the wall, even in the Madras stone flooring pattern, they are governed by this singular proportional system called Lee modular. Now, the important thing why this helps is because everything perceptively seems connected in proportion to another. Now, this is not something that your mind is able to read mathematically. It is too quick a thing happening with your mind that if you go through a space, you are not going to do some mathematical calculations, but subconsciously your mind has that perceptive ability to identify that it is proportionately connected. You can try it out. You can try out two spaces which have disproportionate arrangements, you know, that, that for example, the, even the sill line for example is not consistent or the lintel line is not consistent or the door window, uh, you know, the heights at which uh, they have been uh, placed are not consistent and you will find that disturbance in your perception and then you will find another space where you will find your subconscious mind uh, indicating that proportion to you. So, uh, and that is not just Corbusier doing that, there are other architects of renown who maintain that consistency of scale or hierarchy of spaces or they have for example, the ordering device that I talked about, uh, talked to you about earlier. Now, the other thing in the case of cultural context in case of the Sarabhai house which also serves as a very, uh, very wonderful piece of a, you know a kind of a facility for children for example and that is the slide coming in from the roof pavilion down to the pool and here it is the giant slide which is similar to that of the jantar mantar which is there uh, in a couple of cities in north india so he is relating the villa sarabhai with that why talk about the villa sarabhai or the sarabhai house and why talk about the maison shawl because they are this was a very important project in the eyes of the indians in the 1950s now hear me out there was excitement with regard to the villa sarabhai in india similar to the excitement that maison shawl created in europe please understand that Kubusier was the forerunner or was the pioneer of the international style in Europe. So, if Corbusier changed tack and he went back again or rather he, he, he re-identified his, uh, gave a, re, he redefined his architecture with the rugged massing, brutalism, raw concrete, exposed beacon concrete definitely his work would have been very critically studied and therefore the excitement in Europe. Similar excitement, his own work, the Villa Sarabhai in India. The critical interest in Maison Jaul and its imitation in the West assured Indian architects that their agreement 
with the design of the Sarabhai house was within mainstream of global design thought. Now, hear me out again. Please try to understand what I am saying. The very fact that the Indians were able to appreciate the spaces of the Sarabhai house and they were able to appreciate the design of the principles and the principles, design principles behind the Sarabhai house and knowing that same principles have been executed in the Maison Jaul and Maison Jaul itself has become a world renowned project highly acclaimed by western architects as a part of the larger ambit of modernism gave the assurance to the Indian architects that when they are responding with a regional context for Indi modern architecture, they are still within the mainstream idea of a global design theory or global design thought. The ideas of Sarabhai house in tune with climate, materials and social cultural context in India, therefore modernism could fit in a local context. This was important because this gave the Indian architects, the young architects of the time a sure footing to build modernism with a regional identity in India. Now, the impact of Maison Jaul was felt all over including the, and, and so also we can parallelly say the Sarabhai house in India. Uh, this is a building in Europe, this is another. So, uh, these are uh, three different houses, uh, B.B. Doshi done by B.B. Doshi, I believe this has been done by uh, Raj Rival and this has been done by uh, Charles Correa. So, another architect who lay hold of the idea of vernacular architecture with, uh, in connection modernism was U.C. Jain and it was a regional vernacular architecture. The impact of Rajasthan is clearly seen, his buildings reflect the heritage of Rajasthan. For example, the University of Jodhpur in 1971, where he uses a regional material, the yellow sandstone. It is planned with the modernist principles of spatial organization, but the structure and form according is according to the fundamental order of load bearing stone construction. For example, this is a open wing or a corridor in between these lecture halls on either side, which are made with exposed stone and this beam is a stone beam and the, the width of the corridor is uh, as per the maximum uh, length so to speak of the stone beam that was available. So, the, the, the length of the stone beam available defined the width of the corridor. Therefore, short spans were there and the building was solid and small and a solid and small uh, configuration is also good for a hot and dry climate like Rajasthan. Still this mass and profile, so the idea that you see here is a vernacular idea, but it is based on modern rational theory. Now this mass and profile that you see here in the lecture complex, which is one of the most interesting spaces in the Jodhpur University is directly connected to the idea of the stone steps, this flight of stone steps you see here and you see here that are framed in this stout masonry that is an that is an, a, an intimate experience of the old town. So, we find that space similarity within the traditional architecture. Stone is the primary material used in Jodhpur University and it is also the determinant of the structural order as I spoke to you about the beam. Steel and cement have been used minimally and therefore, it is a cost effective design. Now, to counter the hot and dry desert climate, the building had been constructed with a double wall. So, what you see here is that this on the inside is the actual wall with the fenestration of the windows and outside is another wall that is in front of the windows. So, the inner wall is the structural wall with the conventional glazed openings and the outer wall is like a screen or maybe like a bristole, it is a modified version of a bristole and actually becomes a screen to cut out the direct sunlight. So, if you look at these two pictures, it is not uh, very clear. But if you can see it here, you will find this are the fenestration inside and these are the bricks, the stone screens on the outside. So, direct light will not fall on the window, the glare will not come, but you will get diffused light for reading. So, we find this brissole in stone designed by U.C. Jain. I have already shown you this slide earlier in one of the presentations of Kubuzier. We find this brissole in the University of Jodhpur and we find it another project called the Bolotra City Hall. 
Now, in his case, as I told you earlier, the bristle is not directly connected to the building as in the case of Kubusir, but to it is adapted for the hot and dry climate of Rajasthan. In that, it is constructed at a distance from the building to cut the sun from directly impacting on the facade of the building. Now, the stone pergola that you find here, where I just showed you earlier, screens the central node at which these four lecture theatres emerge here, as you find here. And therefore, the lecture theatre design, which is in a step form, is a modern lecture theatre design, but the construction technique used is vernacular. So, we will end with this project and we will come back to a series of other projects where we will talk about these different aspects that constitute the formulation of a critical regional architecture and some of the major iconic Indian architects who have brought about these works to pass. Thank you.